Welcome to your at-home worship this week, and we pray and trust that it will truly be worship for you. Not really too much to say before we get started, except for welcome. Everything's provided on screen, so you don't really need to worry about anything. You can just settle in for worship. We begin with Luther's morning prayer, and this is a prayer many of us learned in confirmation. It's a simple, easily memorizable prayer, too, which is nice, a good one to start your day off, too, which is also nice. But we're including this one in our service because on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., all of us, wherever we are, we stop and say this prayer. And so although it's um, hard to gather in large groups, we can still pray in them. And so we invite you on Sunday at 10 a.m. to join us in this time of prayer. But now, as we begin our worship, let us pray Luther's morning prayer. Let us pray. I give, I give thanks, thanks to you, Heavenly, Heavenly Father, Father, through Jesus Christ, your, your dear Son, that, that you have protected me through the night from all harm and danger. I ask that you would also protect me today from sin and all evil, so that my life and actions may please you. Into your hands I commend myself, my body, my soul, and all that is mine. Let your holy angel be with me, so that, so that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. Amen. And so right in our right early in our worship, we get to why it is that we are free to worship without fear. Our confession and our Lord and Savior's word of forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and all God's children say, Amen. Amen. God of mercy, we, we confess, confess that, that we have sinned against you and against others, both knowingly and unknowingly. You call us to love and we hate. You call us to peace and we bring violence. You call us to be generous and we are greedy. Lord, for these sins and all that we confess now in the silence of our hearts, we have merited your wrath. Forgive, Forgive us, us, Lord. And now receive your absolution. Our scripture for today is the end of the book of Jonah. And of course, when Jonah first gets his call, he runs away. But the Lord comes to him and gives him a second chance. And he preaches a sermon to the Ninevites about God's overthrowing, and they repent. And in mercy, God gives them another chance. And that same chance that Jonah received, somehow rubs him wrong that the Ninevites received it as well. The Lord and Savior, as Jonah says, is merciful, slow to anger, ready to relent. Our Lord overthrows us with his grace, mercy, and love. And so receive all that now as I declare to you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the entire forgiveness of all your sins. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. So let us sing for what God has done. Our hymn is Gather Us In. Let us sing together.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. And now let us pray. Almighty God, show, show us, us the, the gift of, of your, your presence, presence and, and help us to carry your word, word of compassion and grace to all the world. In the, in the name of the one who carried out your love flawlessly, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. And our lector this week is uh, someone from the Carey family, so thank you. Psalm 145, verses 1 through 8. I will exalt you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day will I bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. There is no end to your greatness. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your power. I will speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty and all of your marvelous works. They shall tell the might of your wondrous acts and I will recount your greatness. They shall publish the remembrance of your greatness. They shall sing joyous, joyfully of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And now to prepare for the reading of Holy Scripture, we sing the Gospel Acclamation. from Jonah chapters 3 and 4. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh, Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone great and small put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human being or animal, no herd or flock, shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Human beings and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, Please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it, it, under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah. 
to give shade over his head, to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so, so that it withered. When the sun rose, God prepared a sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, Yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their, their right hand from their left, and also many animals? So ends the reading. Well, we're in the final throes of a season dedicated to one of our favorite activities, counting. And it's not limited to elections either, is it? The Super Bowl is practically a national holiday, and so is Black Friday. We also love measuring TV ratings and streaming numbers. And we've practically made a national pastime out of counting likes, retweets, mentions, and so on. But it's not the counting we're interested in, is it? It's the meaning we divine from the numbers. It's the judgments we impose upon them. <clears throat> like that debate as to whether Michael Jordan or LeBron is the greatest of all time. And when it comes to sports, our little parlor game is harmless enough. Although the havoc it's wreaked on baseball and you might remember that 2019 run on Jeopardy that was so perfectly joyless it might maybe even cause you to think otherwise about our fascination with numbers when it comes to something as uh, recreational as sports. Because counting, it has its place, but when it matters, it's the last thing you want to do. It's the surest way to scrub joy out of your life. <laughs> and I suppose we have to admit the church has not been exempt from this loveless little diversion. In the church, the sport has disguised itself as codes of conduct, both ethical and theological. But no sooner did this game commence than all sorts of bedlam was unleashed. In fact, all we have to show for our centuries of playing this game in the church is all the losses and heartache that we've racked up. It's a hard lesson to learn. And you know, no one ever sets out to play a game they have no chance at winning. You always start under the misguided notion that you'll come out the other side a winner. But the numbers don't lie. The house always wins. The only way to prevail, the only way to prevail is to quit the game altogether. Jonah, though, Jonah thinks he can beat the odds. Jonah's sent to Nineveh, which means nothing to us, but Nineveh had a reputation, and they were Israel's age-old enemy to boot. So God sending Jonah to Nineveh would be like God sending you to your least favorite in-law, or that one Facebook friend, or that group. And we've skipped the infamous part, you know, where Jonah tries running first, but instead is intercepted by a whale. And that may be high drama, but really it's the end that's compelling. After that big fish spits Jonah up on the beach, the word of the Lord comes to him again a second time. And it hasn't changed. Jonah's to go to Nineveh. And this time, Jonah gets the drift. He goes, but he gives one of the most half-hearted sermons you've ever heard. 
40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown, he says. It's just five words in Hebrew. Lukewarm, though Jonah's sermon may be, the response of the people of Nineveh is nothing less than heated. They all repent on the spot. Even the king gets in on the action. With just five little words, Jonah has become the most successful evangelist in history. Instead of being elated, though, he's upset. He's upset. This is what I told you would happen. He huffs to God. You're soft on sinners. You always have been. And of course, things deteriorate from there. Jonah leaves town and goes up on a hill to see if Nineveh will get theirs after all. And God appoints and then destroys a bush in an object lesson. But Jonah seems to be unable to see past his bent out of shape nose to get the lesson. So finally God puts it to him. Why shouldn't be God why shouldn't God be concerned about all those people? Even God, it appears, is not exempt from this game of counting. Only God's math is totally different. You know, to Jonah's reckoning, God should be counting, counting sins. But God, it would seem, has subtracted that factor from the equation entirely. Now, centuries later, St. Paul, he will be blinded, but it will open his eyes to see what Jonah failed to. The sign of Jonah, as Jesus put it, that by Jesus' three days, not in the belly of a fish, but in the, in the tomb, by those three days... God has laid to rest that tired old game of counting trespasses once and for all. God doesn't count, and that's all that counts. Jonah, though, he's too busy counting to see this. And of course, the irony is he's living by that same second chance. He's begrudging God for extending to the people of Nineveh. Remember, the word of the Lord came to him a second time. God hasn't given up on Jonah, but he's begrudging God for not giving up on the people of Nineveh. You see, here's how it works. When you realize, when I realize, when we realize how deep in Dutch we'd be if our trespasses were counted against us, not only would we willingly walk away from that tired old game of bean counting, we will stop trying to force others to play it too. We'll stop trying to force others to play it too. It's a game we all lose. It's a joyless way to live. Now, maybe today you're like Jonah. Maybe today you're like Jonah and you can't see this because you're too busy counting others' trespasses against them. And God gave, gave it to, know, to Jonah in a question. But Jesus, when he taught us the prayer, that includes forgive us our sins as we've forgiven others, he put it like this. If you don't forgive, why should you suppose you'll be forgiven? In other words, allow me to open your eyes. You are a sinner too. And so am I. But more than likely, my suspicion is that you're like me right now. And after the week you've had, you can't pretend anymore. You know you're a sinner. You're all too ready to have that game of counting trespasses called because you know you stand in arrears. And you know if that's where you are, good. Good. Because that puts you under the sign of Jonah on the other side of those three days. When Jesus said, it is finished from the cross, he meant it. Jesus, by his death and resurrection, brought that old game of counting trespasses to its end once and for all. Game over. And so now you see, like St. Paul said in another place, we can no longer regard one another from a human point of view. You can no longer see yourself from a human point of view. Now the only way to see each other, to see yourself, to see your reflection, 
is from the other side of those three days. From the other side of them, when all sins are forgiven and all wrongs laid to rest. The response to the word is a response of faith. So with the whole church, let us confess the Christian faith. I believe, I believe in, in God, God, the Father, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And so our worship continues now with the prayers of intercession, and after each one of our intercessions, each one of our prayers, I will end that prayer with, Lord, in your mercy, and the response is, hear our prayer. And so now, on account of Christ's mercy, let us bring our prayers for the church, the world, and all in need before the Lord. O oh Lord, just like your servant Jonah, you have called us, and not just once, but over and over again. And we can resist that call, but it is about as fun as spending three days in a whale's belly. Lord, may we hear your call and respond to your call and get swept up in this call of grace, mercy, and love for our own joy, but for also the joy that Jesus had set before him of the world's redemption. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, like Jonah, you call us. In our baptism, we have received a particular, special, and clear calling. Calling marked in Jesus' name, sealed by his cross forever. We give thanks for this blessing that no matter where we find ourselves, the belly of a fish, that you are with us, and you are working our redemption. And Lord, we know what a comfort this has been. And so we ask that, like Jonah, we wouldn't run, but that we would go and speak this word that overturns hearts, reforms lives, for our own joy, but for the joy of also the joy of those who will hear this message as good news that you have come to overturn their lives to. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Lord, this call, it, it was true for Jonah, it's true for us, it's, it's true for all those whom you speak to. And we give thanks that this call is not ours alone, but that we share it with others who bear your name. And we pray for them, and in the silence of our hearts, we all have those particular sisters and brothers in Christ who are special to us, those other congregations, those other little outposts of grace, and we bring them before you. In particular, we also would like to pray for St. John AME and Oak Street Baptist, Messiah, Bethany, and Peace Lutheran here in town, the Synod we are a part of, our, our leadership there, our Bishop Amy, the ELCA we are a part of, and the congregations that make up this denomination and our leadership, Elizabeth, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Oh Lord, this call, it turns things upside down, it overturns things, and that can be scary, and in a way we understand why Jonah ran, but Lord, ultimately, your turning things over is better than the way things are. And Lord, in the signs of our hearts now, we're going to do two things. With Thanksgiving, we're going to pray for those places where you have flipped things over, and, and we see that this call of yours really is the better way, and we give thanks for them. And also with uh, fear and 
grief and anxiety. We bring those places where it just seems like the same old, same old continues to go on and things get worse. And it's harder to trust that your word has the power to change things. And we bring those before you in hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Oh Lord, this call, like Jonah, it doesn't just come to its once. It chases us wherever we go. We can't outrun it. And those who know exactly what this means are those of all people who have died. We've laid to rest. And like Jonah, they found that even there, your call goes to them. It says, rise up, just like it did to Jonah. Although, in the death, it doesn't say go to Nineveh, but it says, Follow me into eternity. And so they have. And there they sing your praises that never end. And Lord, trusting that this call that we've received is no different, we ask by the power of your call to unite our humble praise and prayer, wherever they may be, with the great eternal one with you around the saints, around your throne. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. And so now we raise these prayers and all that go unspoken to you, O God, in the name of the one who is, who was, and who is to come, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. And so now our worship continues with a litany, the thanksgiving for the word. And after each one of our thanksgivings, I will conclude with, for your word of life, O God, and the responses we give you thanks and praise. Let us pray. Praise and thanks to you, holy God. For by your word you made all things. You spoke light into darkness. You called forth beauty from chaos. You brought life into being. For your word of life, O oh God, we give, we give you, you thanks. thanks and praise. By your word you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts. Freedom from exile. Freedom from captivity. Water on the desert journey. A pathway home from exile. Wisdom for life with you. For your word of life, O oh God, we, we give, give you thanks and praise. Through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness. Forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of your self-giving love. For your word of life, O oh God, we, we give, give you thanks and praise. So now send your spirit of truth, O oh God, rekindle your gifts within us, renew our faith, increase our hope, and deepen our love for the sake of a world in need. Faithful to your word, O oh God, draw near to all who call on you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. And so now be of good courage, hold fast to that which is good, render to no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor all people, love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. And so, let us prepare to conclude our worship with a hymn. Our sending hymn is, Wash, O God, Our Sons and Daughters. Let us sing together.
shall receive your blessing. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. And so our worship concludes with the Lord's Prayer. And on Saturday evenings at 5.30 and Sunday mornings at 11, we all, all of us, wherever we are, stop and say this prayer together. And we invite you to join us in those times of prayer. But now, gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our, Our Father, who Lord art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we invite you to stick around for the announcements right after this. But now, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. All right. Well, thank you for worshiping with us. Just um, a few announcements. First of all, of course, if it's your first week worshiping with us, special welcome. We hope everything made sense. If it didn't, just get a hold of us. And even if it did, we hope if it's the first time you're worshiping with us, you'll be in touch because it's nice to be in touch with each other, especially during these days. The announcement is just LSI Christmas. The families that we're sponsoring, thank you for all the um, uh, donations we've had toward that. We're practically toward our goal, so thank you. Um, we've talked, it's been a while since I talked about the Crop Walk, a fundraiser that we've done each year for. Um, hunger issues, both locally and abroad, and this year, of course, the walk itself didn't happen and we collected funds, and those have been coming in, um, so thank you, and it's not too late to get those in. And if you want more information about these and what I've said doesn't make sense, just send us a message, we'll get you the info you need. And along those lines, that COVID fund, thank you. If you know of anyone who could use it or could use it yourself, get a hold of us. You'd like to contribute to it, get a hold of us. Thanks to those who helped with recording the Service, if you would like to help, if you'd like to be one of our readers, our lectors, or one of the singers during the service, our cantor, that'd be wonderful. We'd love to have you. Just get a hold of us and we'll make that happen. So otherwise then, just next week is Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, famous prophet. And it's the story of his calling or his commission. That's Isaiah 6. So that's what we have next week. And then lastly, I'm recording this here because we've got something really cool planned for Advent. And you can kind of see some of the stuff. It's a... DIY, do-it-yourself, at-home Advent wreath for the beginning of the Advent services. And if you would like to get the materials to make your own, let us know. We're going to start collecting those now so we can have everything we need built and get it all to you before Advent, which is the end of this month, actually. So those are all of our announcements. Thank you very much. Uh, have a good week. Bye. Mm -hmm.